Hi everyone, uh, my name is George Gigiashvili uh, and welcome to today's panel entitled What's Next for VR and AR? This is part of MediaTel's The Future of Gaming event. I'm joined today by Elise Shu, who is product manager of the AR platform at Facebook. Fenton Gillespie, the international head of direct response at Snap and Jamie Mosaibi, the AR and VR Creative Director at Cassette. Before we go into uh, our presentation and also let our panelists introduce themselves, I just wanted to share a couple of slides uh, just to set the scene and also uh, kind of talk about a couple of, th couple of things ahead of our discussion to make things uh, kind of a, a lot clearer for everyone. So first of all, I want, on, on the first slide, I just wanted to highlight um, different types of VR and AR categories and devices, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, so starting with VR, uh, first of all, we have smartphone VR. So this is a type of VR headsets that you've probably come across a lot. So these are the ones you slot in your smartphones. And um, most predominant, but at the same time, this is a category that is in decline because, as it turned out, you know, it, a lot of people did not persistently use these devices. But the types of devices that, that are seeing a lot of growth right now are home VR and standalone VR headsets. So these are the ones, uh, home VR is the type of devices that you connect to a PC or a, or a console, and standalone VR as a, you know, an all-in-one headsets like Oculus Quest. On the AR front, uh, you have smart glasses such as Google Glass, and more enhanced versions of that are called mixed reality or, or extended reality headsets, such as um, uh, HoloLens or Magic Leap. And uh, the biggest um, augmented reality uh, device category is smartphones. So um, AR Kit and AR Co, uh, led by, uh, by Apple and uh, Google. Uh, has led to an explosion of number of AR capable devices. Uh, and along with that, you know, you have uh, various software development kits, such as those from Facebook and Snap, uh, which enable developers or just people uh, to create various filters and AR uh, kind of functions. On the second slide, I'm just going to briefly uh, to show some of the top line numbers of uh, VR and AR. So at the moment, VR uh, is active install base for consumers is about 23 million headset units, which is not a lot when you compare it to other types of device categories, but this will grow over the next five years. And so will the revenue generated by VR uh, headsets and uh, uh, such as, you know, uh, again, talking about things like PlayStation VR and uh, Oculus Rift and so on. AR glasses at the moment is a super niche category, not really picked up by consumers, driven by enterprises. Only about 200,000 units were shipped last year, but this will grow, particularly as uh, players like you know, Apple enter the space. We'll see uh, a bit larger adoption coming from consumers over the next five years. And as I mentioned earlier, the biggest category so far uh, when it comes to augmented reality is smartphones. And uh, last year, uh, and at the end of last year, there were 2.3 billion smartphones uh, which were capable of uh, experiencing augmented reality apps and features. And this will only grow to reach 5.3 billion. So a huge and massive uh, addressable base there for augmented reality via smartphones. And uh, together with that, you know, we'll, we will see an, uh, a, a huge rise in revenues you know, of mobile AR games, but also mobile uh, AR revenue in general as well, beyond games as well. Right, uh, so with that out of the way, now I uh, just wanted to uh, let uh, our panelists you know, properly introduce themselves and also tell us about kind of what they do and also perhaps highlight some of the kind of recent uh, projects that they've been working on within the AR, VR, and also gaming space. So uh, Elise, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. So my name is Elise Chu. I'm a product manager building and scaling the augmented reality platform at Facebook. I focus more on AR on smartphones. So as George mentioned, that's where 
developers, businesses, and creators have the greatest reach with AR content today. My team works on the Spark AR Studio software, which is used by people around the world to create AR experiences in the Facebook family of apps. Anyone can try for free, you can download it at sparkar.com. And then just to highlight some recent trends we've seen in AR usage, so certainly during this time with the pandemic going on, AR, like other digital technologies, has been more and more important for people to stay in touch with their th friends and family and what they're interested in. So one of our focuses has just been to use AR to help people stay connected. The other trend is that we are seeing more usage of AR for utility use cases on smartphones. So I think the first widespread use case for AR was more around social sharing, communication, the Facebook family of apps. But more recently, we've seen more and more usage of AR for advertising, for shopping. So just to quickly point out two things, any business can create an AR ad in Facebook newsfeed that lets people try on products like cosmetics or furniture virtually. And then we just announced uh, the launch of Facebook Shop. So now businesses can set up digital storefronts on Facebook and Instagram. And we expect to see AR being used to help people buy and try on products when they're shopping in these digital shops as well. Excellent. Really interesting. Thank you. We'll definitely pick up on some of those things that you mentioned. Uh, Fintan. Hey guys, so my name is Fintan Gillespie. Um, I work on the enterprise business solutions team at Snapchat. So primarily we work with brands to bring their campaigns to life uh, on the platform. I think AOR is a really important part of the Snapchat proposition, given that we launch to the camera and about a third of our users play with augmented reality every single day. Um, actually throughout the COVID period, we've seen a 25% increase in engagement in our AR lenses late March versus late Feb. Um, so definitely see an in, uh, like increase in engagement of AR throughout this period. And we also have a uh, desktop AR, which I can show you very quickly. <laughs> um, so I'm putting on the latest Snapchat Spectacles 3, and this is using uh, the Snap Camera, which anyone can download if they search, and search for Snap Camera. Um, and essentially what this does is bring all the best parts of Snap Augmented Reality to your webcam. So for any uh, video conferencing that you're going through at the moment, you can download the Snap Camera, you can search across our entire library of community and snap created um, lenses and again echoing the sort of utility benefit of augmented reality in this example here you know you can see the brand new spectacles three on my face uh, uh, i can play around with it get a sense for how it fits on my face and you know obviously there's huge utility benefit to um to augmented reality from that perspective and we've seen this sort of being used uh, across a kind of big span of industries from you know, beauty and try before you buy, you know, beauty products to consumer hardware, like the one I'm trying on now to autos, um, where Toyota and BMW have worked with us to bring full fledged 3D versions of their cars and allow users to play with them in the front facing camera um, uh, to Louis Vuitton handbags. So, you know, we've seen a big array of sort of utility benefits. And I think this is particularly pertinent during this time when people can't actually have that real world store experience, actually they can play with it uh, in, in the digital world. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. And Jamie, let's hear from you. Hi guys. Uh, so yeah, I'm a creative director at Cassette. Um, so we're part of the On The Com experiential group. So rather than the platform side, we're very much in the content creation side. Um, and with that comes quite a broad range uh, of projects from uh, working in the healthcare sector, so building virtual reality training tools. Uh, we completed a project for training healthcare professionals uh, in a specific uh, part of oncology, um, and we created a platform for that called Pathway. And on the other end of the spectrum, we've built uh, worked with quite a few automotive clients at big events like Goodwood, um, and we built racing games uh, that half serve as an entertaining game, but also educating people on electric cars um, and sort of the future of mobility. Um, so we work on a broad range of things. We, all of our content, well, majority of our content is in virtual and augmented reality, um, but all of it is in using real time packages. So one of the things we're facing in this current climate is thinking about how events will be executed um, at a distance. So on top of 
obviously things like this, uh, doing it over a video call, but also can we uh, convert to reality environments to be used as a shared collaboration space with users mm -hmm. jumping in a headset. So it's these are all challenges we were aware of and we saw trends in people thinking about adopting because of things like uh, environmental challenges for large companies. Mm -hmm. But I think our current climate has just accelerated it. So um, it, yeah, we're just uh, trying to play and catch up at the moment. Cool. Awesome. And Jamie, given that you know you work so closely with virtual reality, let's start with VR. So, you know, I think it's fair to say that, you know, everyone in this industry got caught up with the VR hype about five years ago. Uh, and, um, you know, it's 2020 now and you know, VR still remains in a relatively niche proposition, particularly when you look at the active install base. Um, but I think uh, this is changing for the better. And I think you'd agree with me, you know, with uh, like things like Oculus, uh, just this month, they reported that in one year of Oculus Quest being on the market, it generated more than hundred million dollars of revenue from the, the content. So do you think this is a one-off uh, for VR, the success of quests, or, or do you think this is more of a new direction for VR? No, I think I think it's a new direction. I think there were a lot of hurdles um, that VR had to uh, face, uh, both hardware, content, um, tons of issues, um, and generally there was just a lot of friction uh, the Samsung headsets, the mobile-based ones you mentioned, they, they proved some really interesting things, but they they also proved that people don't want to uh, drop their mobile, you know, use their mobile phone in a, in a plastic headset. Yeah. People like uh, being able to grab and touch things. They want interactive content rather than passive content. So there's, a, there's an enormous amount of challenges, and I think uh, Facebook were right uh, and Oculus when they said, it's taking longer than they anticipated mm -hmm. and they don't mind, you know, if it takes it 10 years uh, yeah. to get to mass adoption, that's fine. From from our perspective in building relatively niche products for a subset of enterprise or say an event for people to visit uh, pre-COVID, uh, mass adoption isn't necessarily a concern of ours. Like we're quite happy at the moment to um, work where, where, we, where we capture an audience to work mm -hmm. for that. Obviously, it would be great when everyone's got one in their home, but I think um, it's just not going to be an immediate spike of users jumping in it overnight. It's just going to be a slow burn. But at the moment, that slow burn's really exciting and the right boxes are being checked. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's great. And uh, I think your VR in general, particularly in the consumer space, is kind of facing mm. this classic chicken and egg situation, isn't it? Mm. With consumers waiting for the, for the killer app and then um, and vice versa. Uh, yeah. But I think this is changing, you know, because the content was always a big point of contention when it came mm -hmm. to VR. But I think you have amazing content now. You know, you have breakout hits like you know, Beat Saber, really mm -hmm. appealing across uh, you know, all types of gamers, really, not just, you know, super uh, kind of dedicated gamers. Yeah. And, you know, you also have, you know, Valve with the much anticipated Half-Life sequel coming out as a VR game. So I think there's a lot to be excited in this space. So, mm. so even though the gaming, as you said, you know, is, um, uh, is the low hanging fruit for VR, I think there is the other side of things, stuff that you're working on, kind of enterprise or just kind of, it's kind of very use, kind of specific use cases for VR, which I think is really, really interesting. So, um, so and with that in mind, Jamie, kind of what, what is it about VR that those brands are interested in? So why are they coming to you to kind of uh, build these different experiences? What does VR have that uh, traditional formats don't? Mm. So I think there's there's like a, quite a few um, options from uh, reasons really from from a sort of um, advertising perspective. You're also, you're capturing an audience in a really unique way and undistracted as well is quite an interesting point. So, you, can, um, you know, it's, there aren't really any other mediums out there where you have someone's full attention for, say, 10, 15 minutes where they can't actually check their phone. Like it is something that is being built into some VR experiences from a consumer level. But generally in a, at an event, you know, if we've got someone for 10 minutes, it's a really immersive way. Well, it is the most immersive yeah. way to grab them from an enterprise level, um, from a training point of view. Um, we know from studies that people are generally more effective when they learn do things but, but by doing rather mm. than being told through video or textbooks mm. or that. Um, so we know that's more effective and then on top of that we know that we can we can draw analytics from them training 
and use that to inform other aspects of the business. The thing is, virtual simulated training has been around forever. Like, you know, it's been around since the pilot days. F1 drivers have been using it. It's, it's not necessarily a new thing. And many of our clients we're speaking to, we were speaking to them three years ago. The only difference now is the hardware, um, the barrier for entry has got lower. So rather than having to lug a gaming PC home with them, they can take an Oculus Quest, draw a little boundary in their living room or their kitchen um, and simulate a surgery. Like, you know, that, that for, and that's why you're seeing organizations like the NHS, part of their foundation for bringing on new doctors is a simulated module that uses simulated tools. So I suppose um, they're coming to us because we can, we can reduce the risk of training, we can reduce the costs of training, we can increase the dwell time that they might have access to an expensive machine by replicating it virtually. Um, and also from, a, from communicating complex messages like uh, the future of mobility, we can create fun games where you're not necessarily feeling like you're stuck in a lecture, um, but you're having a bit of fun, but you're also understanding the complexities of autonomous drive, autonomous and electric driving, for example. Um, so it's a real, um, it's a real multifaceted advantage compared to traditional mediums. Great, uh, thank you. That's really, really insightful. Uh, Elise, you know your extended colleagues uh, are currently working on a social VR platform called Horizon, which I think is really interesting. I know it's still in beta at the moment, but um, I think that's a really interesting one because you know VR has got this bad reputation of being this kind of like a solitary experience, whereas actually fact is they can be very social and you know there there are existing platforms like rec room for example that has proven that actually it's a really cool and interactive way to to uh, um kind of uh interact with other people play games and so on um so i think social vr and virtual social presence i think is going to be uh, another big driver uh, for vr and it'd be i'm really looking forward to seeing what how that pans out when facebook brings that out and talking about social, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, move that along towards um, a conversation about augmented reality. And at least, um, you know, your team kind of looks at augmented reality and how that works with social uh, media apps, you know, particularly, you know, when it comes to Facebook or Instagram. So um, can you kind of give us any insights into kind of what kind of what is is it about augmented reality? Kind of how that how, how does that enhance the you know the usual communication through social apps? Yeah, and I'm sure Vincent will have insights on this as well from the Snapchat perspective. But generally speaking, AR in the social realm is a way for people to share moments of their lives with friends and family when they're sharing photos or videos of moments of, from their lives on Instagram or Messenger or Facebook, they can add an AR filter to make that photo or video more engaging, maybe show, include a cultural reference to show uh, that they're making reference to a cultural trend or a meme or a joke, or just to make a moment more fun than it otherwise would be. Especially these days when we're all just staying at home, it can sometimes feel like I don't have anything interesting to share and adding a fun AR filter can really make that difference for you when you want to share a moment. Excellent. And I guess similar question for you, Finton, because you know, Snapchat in many ways was the pioneer of uh, using uh, augmented reality filters as part of that social interaction. Um, so kind of what's your thoughts on that in terms of kind of you utilizing how augmented reality enhances the you know, social communication? I think we're part of this exciting trend of a move away from communication with keyboards that you know I grew up with in my generation to communication through the camera. Um, you know, Snapchat evolved as the first selfie-enabled or selfie camera-enabled iPhone came to the market, and so we're seeing this tremendous trend in in user behavior and digital. Um, and I think you know the camera has so many uh, interesting features that can augment and make photos and videos so much more appealing and engaging yeah. and I think augmented reality is absolutely a part of that um, and so you know it's just on, on snap it's just really part of the user's everyday life on the platform you know as I mentioned earlier a third of our users come in every day and just play with the lenses mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily going in with the mindset of using a camera uh, they're going in just to play around and be playful sometimes mm -hmm. they don't even share the lenses and um, it's just a kind of 
uh, have fun and be playful. And I think that's very much the essence of the platform we're trying to to build at Snap. Um, and AOR is absolutely at the core of what we're trying to do. Like we're, I think we're at the very beginning of an exciting shift in computing. I think in the future, computing will be overlaid on top of the world around us, mm-hmm. not just constrained to the screen in our hand. And you know, we're building sort of building blocks at Snap towards that sort of future. Um, so, you know, be that with uh, understanding the world around you through the camera or providing a platform for creators to build AR experiences through Lens Studio uh, or investing in future hardware sort of transcended to the to the smartphone, which is what we're doing with our Spectacles product. And, uh, and Vincent, uh, you know, We've seen many success stories already of branded filters, for example, uh, that many big brands have been able to successfully use to raise sure. awareness for particular particular products or events. So, so I guess similar question to what I asked Jamie, kind of what is it about augmented reality that makes those brands attracted to this medium? I think it's like uh, generally when we work with brands and we, it, you know, they're bring, it's almost like they're bringing something physical to life. And I don't think in media it's like such a different engaging format and you know we work with uh, the brand and uh, um, you know either their partner agency or we build in-house to produce an asset from a storyboard all the way to real life and they can try it and test it out uh, through the production period to bring something to life and I think that's very new in sort of the mobile marketing and media space and, and brands really love it and also the dwell time on our branded lenses, you know, you're talking over tw- over 10 seconds on average. It's just so much more than on multiple other sort of formats in digital media. Um, and I think, you know, I, I talked earlier about the utility benefit, like, you know, Adidas can come to us and they have a new sneaker and we can build a three, 3D model of that sneaker and they can be prompted on the brand campaign to, users can be prompted to point the camera at their feet and it puts the AR shoes on them, you know, try before you buy sort of thing. And I think that's a great benefit, for particularly it just really enables and enhances the ability of, you know, e-commerce advertisers to, to tell their story on the platform. Um, we have other great examples as well. I think particularly uh, during the sort of COVID period, we've seen a lot of, um, you know, our community, and also nonprofits and artists react. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the Damien Hurst lens that we built, um, uh, which is, I think, super interesting. Um, basically, you can create your own personalized art, and then we had a link to put all push all proceeds to charity, uh, working with Damien Hurst on that. Um, and that was spinning art that was created through our augmented reality lenses. I think another great example is our marker tech. So we're able to scan objects in the real world and then augment them through the Snapchat camera. I think a great example of that was the new 20 pound note in the UK where we partner with Tate Britain, the National Gallery and the Bank of England. And you can essentially scan uh, the new 20 pound note and it sort of brings uh, uh, JMW Turner's painting uh, the fighting Temerine, Temerine to, to life in AR, which I think is super unique and mm. um, uh, super exciting for users to play with. Excellent. Those are great, great points. I definitely yeah, go, ahead. Echo. go ahead, Elise. I just wanted to say I definitely echo those points about the, the value and the magic of AR, bring the physical to life. One recent example we've done is a partnership with NBC Universal to launch a poppy full AR filter on Instagram. This was in conjunction with their virtual release online of the Trolls World Tour film. And this filter lets you take a picture with a virtual 3D model of Poppy um, in your living room. So it's an example of bringing something physical to life, as well as I think the other interesting aspect of AR is that it lets the user engage back with the brand. So the brand releases a filter then users create more photos and videos of their own with that filter and then the brand can engage back with what they're sharing so you have this remixing of content to continue the dialogue that was started by the original filter other examples from more of a utility oriented scenario as been mentioned would be bring things that are physical to life for trying on products and just to provide some data points on how that really help brands is in Facebook tests of AR ads, we piloted uh, one of our first tests with Michael Kors to try mm-hmm. on aviator sunglasses, and they saw a 14% uh, 
incremental lift in purchases compared to video ads. We've also seen really incredible stats in tests with Sephora and Bobby Brown, four times and three times the click-through rate compared to video ads, respectively, for those brands. So those are just some data points for the highlight. The point he was making about the fact that this really has measurable value for the brands in terms of getting their consumers to engage with their products. Awesome. Cool. Uh, I just wanted to briefly move on to uh, AR glasses. And, you know, you guys might have seen some of the apparent kind of leaks about um, what Apple is doing in this space, which is really interesting. Uh, they're obviously, uh, they're, they've been looking into this area for a while now. So, so now kind of this conversation is back on about this consumer use cases for augmented reality glasses. Uh, at the same time, beginning of this month, we've had a Magic Leap completely stepping away from consumer to fo focus on enterprise because they just couldn't really nail that. Um, so uh, with that in mind, I just wanted to kind of maybe bring it to uh, bring the question to, to Finton, uh, given that in the spe uh, in Spectacles, Snapchat is very much involved in this space. So uh, what, how do you think a physical uh, device as, as kind of spectacles or augmented reality headsets can enhance the kind of the augmented reality experiences that we've been talking about today. Yeah, I think it's a it's a, and like we we made a deliberate decision to invest in sort of making AR technology accessible to any creative person um, uh, in any way they want to you know play with AR or, or experience the snap camera and I think hardware is like a really important pillar in that. Um, I think with spectacles, what we're trying to do is rather than um, build, you know, spend multiple years building something secretly in an R&D department is to actually bring consumers on the journey with us. Um, and as you've known, like we've iterated now to the third version of, of spectacles. I think the third version, spectacles three, is probably the most interesting uh, uh, new version of spectacles because it's the first um, uh, version of spectacles that has a dual camera system. So for the first time, this hardware um, can understand depth. And that means that we're able to connect it to our Lens Studio platform. So anything you capture with spectacles, uh, when you download it uh, to Snap, you can actually overlay um, uh, community built or Snap built uh, lenses that were specifically made for spectacles capture. And I think that's a really, really cool uh, evolution uh, mm -hmm. given that uh, spectacles is a very different medium. You know, the, the, the sensor on the camera is circular. It's designed uh, to capture more easy when you're on the go. So you can capture things in the moment without having to pull out your phone. And I think adding augmented reality in post capture really just um, pushes the boundaries in terms of what creative people can do with, with this product. Excellent. Thank you, Finson. So we've got about two minutes left. So and with that, I wanted to ask each and one of you to kind of give a kind of highlighted advice to any company that's looking into AR or VR, getting involved in this space. So what would be your kind of, your, your kind of top tips or top advice, uh, uh, you know, to these companies? So let's start with you, Jamie, for example. Um, I think don't be, uh, don't be scared to approach a company like Cassette and, and work together to maybe fund like a really small prototype. Um, there's lots of little ways and often there's one person in a business who's really up for VR and AR and excited about it. And there's a lot of people that need convincing. Uh, so sometimes you can, as they say in the gaming industry, create like a vertical slice and mm -hmm. just make a small little case use, uh, get that built, signed off, and then use it to sell it internally. So yeah, don't be scared to make something little to begin with. Thank you. Elise? Yeah, I would echo that. I think AR and smartphones is actually a great way to get your feet wet. You know, even just through the Facebook app alone, over 1.5 billion people have access to AR experiences. So it's a way to get wide reach while building a somewhat lightweight experience that doesn't require a ton of development time. And with our platform, you can build once and it works on both Android and iOS. So I would encourage you to try out smartphone AR and uh, especially for the more bite-sized experiences that are relatively easy to build. and like we've talked about, can yield a lot of value either to help people connect with friends and family or to help them shop online. The last thing I'd say is just think about whether something is truly better in AR. I think we have seen examples of experiences that are kind of gimmicky and don't really work that well. And it's not 
truly 10 times better in AR than just on your on a 2D uh, surface. So really think about what's value for your end user. Great, excellent, Elise. And Fintan. Yeah, I think it's I think now is like AR, particularly on mobile smartphone, as Elise alluded to, is now democratized. Like we have um, platforms that are super advanced, like Lens Studio can be really advanced. You know, you can do all of the sort of um, advanced JavaScript features in the Lens Studio platform, but we also have templates in the platform that allow anyone with no experience in 3D design to come in and design a lens. And then on top of that, for the more small to medium sized advertisers, we also have um, Lens Web Builder that allows you to essentially log on and create a lens from templates in minutes without any experience. So I think really the message there is that, you know, AR ads and um, AOR formats are now really available to everyone and there's very low barrier to entries, entry now and so the advice would be to you know to work with your partner agencies and platforms to to try and test and bring these to life because you know from some of the evidence that we shared today that they're just so much more uh, engaging as formats in the in your media marketing mix. Excellent guys thanks so much for your time it was a pleasure we could I think easily to go on and talk about this for another half an hour but unfortunately we can't but for those of you who got more questions, feel free to reach out to us on social media, Twitter, whatever. Um, but anyway, thank you very much and take care. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you so much.